Hello and welcome to the big league where I have a headache and the NHL is just gone insane. Uh, we're going to get into all of that, trust me, but of course we have to do our interview person first because we're psychopaths. Um, but Aiden and our guest, Nigel, how are you two guys doing today? I'm doing lovely. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. It is a pleasure as always. Thank you very much. It's good to have you here. Uh, we've been looking to get you on for a while. We've always kept you in, in the back of our heads, so it's good to finally have you on. Um, and yeah, I'm doing good. Um, finally got a day off of work this week, so decided to record a podcast. Just been watching TSN and Sportsnet all day as well. Lots of signings and, and trades going on, so it's, uh, it's going to be an exciting one today. Yes, and I have my buzzer ready. Oh, one, one. <laughs> oh. There we go. That ready for if anything happens while we're talking. Nigel and everything he's done. Uh, but we have to start it off. We're going to get through this interview portion as quickly as possible to avoid what happened with Jack. Because that was insane. That, that was chaos. It was like we were doing the interview and just like the ekman Larson trade broke. You oh, yeah, a little bit of everything, the, eh? Yeah. The sound yeah. effect. Like, <laughs> lots of interruptions there. I feel bad for Jack because we like cut off so many of his answers because of trades. But uh, yeah. yeah, we're going to yeah. avoid doing that today, hopefully. Uh, yeah. But we start off with the same question we always ask, because it I just love watching our guests squirm. I'm a terrible person. Uh, but what is your first memory of sports, and what is your first memory of sport media? Uh, so I'd probably say my first memory of sports. Um, I guess it's not really my own memory, but we have a photo of my dad. I think I'm like five months old uh, in a Leafs like onesie little thing for a baby, watching the game with my dad. Uh, sitting on his lap he's wearing a Leafs jersey so that's like my first like I think that's like what my parents knew that I was just gonna be loving sports because I was glued to the tv my first actual memory of sports probably stems from Timbit soccer uh, I, I played soccer uh, growing up um that was my my go-to sport so I'd say probably like under four under five uh playing soccer obviously it wasn't great um but that was probably like my first memory of actually playing sport uh first memory of sport media that's a that's actually a really good question. I would probably say when I started paying attention to sport media, when I started thinking like, wow, this is something that I'm really interested in. Uh, I'd say the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. I'm I'm sure that's maybe a popular answer or something that you know you can imagine. But I think for a lot of people our age, especially growing up in Canada, that was a games that really um you know hooked a lot of people on the whole thing of sports. And I just remember being absolutely encapsulated by everything going on during those games and. Ultimately, I was like, this is something that I, I definitely could see myself doing one day. And here we are like 11 years later in, in the sport media program at Ryerson. And yeah, the rest is history. So yeah, Nigel, you're a big Leafs fan, obviously, I guess. I From starting off at a very, very young age, you've been uh, grounded into this team. And <laughs> yeah. It's been an unfortunate uh, 20 years or so for you so far. Um, but uh, how has that, um, I guess, relationship with a team like the Toronto Maple Leafs kind of helped grow your, your passion for sports, but has it also like, do you think if you were a Leafs fan, like if you weren't a Leafs fan, actually, would you be in sport media? Um, yeah, I, that's actually a really good question. I think, I think it's in a way, obviously it's been, like you said, torturous to support a team like the Leafs over the past 20 years, but in a way, like, I think it's been good for me because it's like it can't get any worse year in year out like you, or you think that and then somehow it does you blow a 3-1 lead to the Habs but uh I would say in a way yeah I think um you know being a part being a fan of a team like the Leafs definitely um you know in Canada at least the team with the most media coverage uh you see a lot you know you just have to watch any free agent friendly frenzy any trade deadline special it's all the talk is about the Leafs even if they're not making signings or deals um, so I think just growing up with that kind of exposure to the Leafs and being the big team in Canada uh, really helped me realize like the whole media side of things and how the media thing goes apart. So I'd say, yeah, it's definitely a big part of why I wanted to go into this program and why I wanted to pursue a career in it. So, yeah, you can go ahead, Connor. I was going to say, when did you hear about the program? Uh, so when I entered grade nine, uh, at my high school, Dundas Valley Secondary School, shout out. Uh, I, I was like, I sold myself. I'm like, I want to do something with sports. Uh, sports is the way I want to go. So I was looking into the Brock Sport Management Program and Ryerson Sport Media, which when I was in grade nine, I'm, are you guys both 2000s yep. babies as well? So yeah, when we were all in grade nine, 
that was actually the first year that program was being offered. And one of my buddies who also wanted to go into sports, he ended up going to sport management at Brock. His sister applied for sport media. Uh, she got declined, but I just like heard about it through that. Kept it on my radar all four years. Started to think I just wanted to go the business route, do something a little more conventional. Uh, and then grade 12 came along and I was like, why not apply? Applied, got in. And like I said earlier, the rest is history. So yeah, I'd say like grade nine was like my first uh, indication of it. So what did you do from grades nine to grades 12 then to help prepare you for just the application process alone? Um, what did people tell you? Like, did you um, go for the open houses at Ryerson? Were you talking to like professors already there, like saying this is what you could do to get in? Um, what kind of advice did you get and, and what did you end up doing to help get in? If I'm going to be honest, I <laughs> really did not. Like, there was a lot of kids in our program who were doing a lot of stuff in high school, calling sports games from the age they were 14, stuff like that. I'm going to be honest, I really didn't do any of that. Um, I still think maybe the only reason why I got in this program is because I did a really good job in my interview and my written application was good, along with having pretty good high school averages. Um, so I honestly, like... It is embarrassing as to say I wasn't one of those kids who was out reporting on hockey games. I wasn't like, you know, going to the Hamilton Bulldogs games, my local OHO team and, you know, taking photos, writing stories for the team. I honestly wasn't. Um, like I said, I kind of put sport media on the back burner and was like, I'm just going to do something a little more conventional. And I kind of just applied to it on a whim. Uh, and I got in and I was like, there's no way I can reject this program with the prestige that it has. And the you know the quality it has i know i'm sure a lot of people in our program are going to hate me for saying that i really didn't do much stuff like that but if i'm just being honest like i really didn't and i i thank my you know i count my blessings every day that i was i was actually able to get in without doing any of that uh pre precursor stuff you'd be surprised at how few people actually did do stuff before yeah they. uh like i did a blog i started in grade 12 you'll never find it um, <laughs> yeah. and I wrote for my school newspaper, which did four editions throughout the school year. Uh, but that was literally it. Mm. And I, honestly, the only people off the top of my head who did stuff going into like what you were saying, going into applying was Pat Talon and Kennedy maybe mm -hmm. as well. It, um, yeah. I feel like Kush, Kyle Kush was doing a lot of stuff in high school. He, he, I've seen some of his like tapes. He was commentating like his school's sports and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I think you're also right. I do know there are several people um, in my, in the program who also have like kind of, we're in the same spot as me who just applied and, and were able to get in. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, if I could go back in time, I probably would start trying to work on some skills before I got into the program because being honest, getting into the program, I had never touched anything in the Adobe Premiere, uh, Photoshop, any of that in my life. Having learned all that was definitely a big curve, uh, learning curve in the first semester of university. I'd never done anything with audio in my life. So uh, audio work in the first semester of, you know, I was really unprepared for what I was getting into. Um, I love it now. It's, you know, I'm very comfortable with all these things now, but getting into them uh, in, in first year is definitely a bit of a culture shock. That's for sure. Yeah, I think a lot of us were like, like even me, like I had a little bit of video experience, but audio, that audio production class in, in oh, first yeah. year, like that was tough. Like I didn't, I don't think I did that well in that class either. Like that was pretty tough, but I, like they, they teach you everything really. You don't mm. really need to come into the program with like a ton of knowledge because they, they go over it all with you and, and you learn things that you probably wouldn't have been taught in high school if you did take like any type of media class. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I guess like the message is like, like when you are applying, like try and do things, yeah. but you don't have to, like you can get in, um, just by having great interview or just by having a good, um, essay when you're writing. So talk to us about the interview. Who interviewed you? Uh, I had Dan Berlin. Uh, it was a very, it's hilarious. So the day before, uh, so I booked my interview cause it was like, I was late to booking it. I don't know what I was thinking, but basically there was only like two more time slots. One was like, I couldn't make, so this is the only time slot I could make. And it was the day after I got back from the Dominican Republic on an all-inclusive vacation. I was there for a week. Uh -huh. So I get back, sunburnt, jet lagged, everything. Uh, next morning, go back to Toronto after flying into Toronto, going home. Next morning, going back to Toronto to do my interview. Um, I, didn't stay I, I know, in hindsight, really should have. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we weren't thinking, I guess. But uh, 
Yeah, had Dan Berlin, uh, and it went really well. I felt very, uh, it was like very conversational. Didn't really feel like an interview. It felt like two people just talking about uh, the sport media industry, the sport media program at Ryerson. And yeah, I, I feel like I honestly do think the culmination of that, my references, my grades, and the essay that we had to do to get in was really the only reason why I got in because I didn't have a portfolio of anything to to showcase really. Interesting. Did you have any connections to media or sport media at all? Like family, friends, anything like that? Uh, no, not really. Um, I had like a couple, like my aunt's a hairdresser. She had a client who was like a producer at CBC. So I, I talked to her a little bit, but that was like, that was really it. Like I didn't know anyone who was working in the sport media industry. I didn't know anyone who was working in the media industry at all, really. Um, so a little unconventional because uh, both my parents work very conventional jobs. Uh, and then I'm going out here trying to get into something like sport media. So a little different, uh, so to speak. But yeah, I think I kind of like started my own path, went my own way with it. And yeah, here we are. Like I said three times now. <laughs> <laughs> was there a part of you that that was still considering going to Brock and, and taking sport management there? Like, like, I guess around grade 12? Yeah, so... When I, I got into sport management like fast, like next week, they're yeah. like, you're in. And I, I was like, I did it next day. Yeah. See, that's they, what I mean. I got <laughs> so clearly the bar wasn't. I mean, I had good grade 12 grades, if I'm being honest, but I clearly the bar was not high to get in. Um, so as soon as I got into that, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Like, this is a program I've been looking at for a long time. Um, and I was really tempted. And Ryerson got back to me super late. It was like April till I found out that I actually got in. And like, there was a point in March where I'm like, I think I'm just going to accept Brock. I'm, I'm done waiting on Ryerson. I have a, not a, like more of an acquaintance who went to my high school. She got into the media production program. Uh, and so I was like, oh, if she got into that, they're probably done accepting people. I'm not going to get in. My parents were like, why don't you just wait? You have till May 1st, wait to see. And uh, yeah, I ended up getting into the sport media program. So I honestly, I'm happy I waited, but there was a part of me that was like, I kind of want to just jump off this media ship right now and go the management route. The funny thing is, here I am about to go in my fourth year, uh, and the route I want to go professionally is more marketing-based, business-based uh, than actually media-based. Uh, so I don't I don't have any regrets in picking this program over the Brock one because I think this program has set me up perfectly to where I want to go and how I want to get there. Uh, but if I was speaking conventionally and you know properly, I think the Brock program is more suited to what I wanted to do. But again, I have no regrets in in doing this program and anything along those lines. Was there a thought of maybe taking like a minor in marketing or are you taking a minor in anything right now? Or are you considering maybe doing another program after sport media? Yeah. So that's, uh, I haven't for a while. I was like, you know what, I'm going to see if I like this whole media thing. And then two years passed and I was like, I really don't see myself working specifically in the media industry. Uh, so I didn't really have time to like ha get enough credits for a minor in hindsight. I probably should have just decided to minor from the start, but here we are. Uh, yeah. but yeah, my, my plan now ultimately is to either go and get an MBA or go to George Brown for the sport marketing program, which is a one year postgraduate program. Uh, either of those options I think are ultimately what I'm going to do. I'm, I haven't decided yet really still got lots of time, probably going to take a year off. Uh, after I after finished the undergrad, but um, yeah, definitely more school is going to be needed to achieve that goal. But I think sport media has put me in like a perfect position, not only just with the uh, connections I've made, but also like the pe uh, people I've met, connections I've made, professors I've met, uh, the skills I've learned, all these things. I think has put me in like the perfect direction I want to go. And so it might take me an extra year, an extra two years, but I I'm perfectly content with it, perfectly happy with it. Yeah, you got a lot of options, a ton of options there. Yeah, but for sure, I guess let's stick within sport media for yeah. for a second here. Um, so, what's been like your favorite course so far? A lot of people say the production one. Are you in that same category, or do you like something completely different? Uh, I okay, I really like the sport marketing classes. I know that's uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I I find that stuff incredibly fascinating. Um, I find the whole marketing thing incredibly fascinating. So I really like those classes. You obviously cannot beat a TV lab, the production classes. Those are um, the most fun I've ever had in a, in a class, really. I think second year TV lab, just such a great time, such a great class, great environment from start to finish. Um, so I'd probably say, yeah, obviously it's a probably a pretty popular answer, but I'd say the TV labs. But if I had to pick one off the board, I would go uh, with sport marketing, I think. Well, we finally got a different answer. 
which is <laughs> um, <laughs> now we've had a couple people say other classes yeah um, the yeah. uh sport That's media it. theory i think with um i forget uh, yeah oh curtis that was yeah good one. yeah it was yeah good one. It would have been so much better if it wasn't 8 a.m. on a Friday. Yes, fully agree with that. But, Even better. It was very good anyways, but yes, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. yeah. It's, they need to make a rule at Ryerson. No classes before like 10 a.m. Because that would be ideal. Um, but I'm curious more on like you want to go the marketing route. You want to mm -hmm. go post-secondary. You want to do another course uh, or program. Um, what do you plan in that year that you plan to take off? Are you going to work? Or are you just going to sort of take a mental break sort of thing? Uh, so dr like dream scenario, this won't happen, but this is my dream scenario. Uh, so as soon as I graduate in April, hopefully of next year, if everything goes to plan. Um, I would love to travel next summer, go to Europe. Um, Europe is a spot that I've wanted to go for such a long time. I went when I was younger, but I wasn't really old enough to appreciate it. So definitely traveling. I think that's a great like reset spend a month or whatever it is traveling away from working away from school kind of just you know having fun for a month so to speak uh and then the dream would be to come back be able to get some form of job in a marketing scenario uh i'll be it maybe not even in sports but at least just to get me experience in it and then after a year head into another program that's the dream goal lord knows it's not going to work that way but if i had to tell you like what the plan is right now if my parents were to come down and ask me what i want to do right now that's what i would tell them i that's got a very really good plan that's a pretty good plan like Thank a lot you. of people don't know what they're going to do after university like i'm not too sure what what exactly is going to happen in in a year from now um but you have a plan at least so that's yeah. a good start where do you want to go to in europe and and you said you've already been right so where have you visited uh, so on my mom's side, I'm Northern Irish. So when I was younger, we went to just all around Northern Ireland and a bit of the South of Ireland. Um, so I definitely want to go back there cause I have a ton of family there, England. Um, I'm a huge Arsenal fan, so I'd love to go. I've never seen a game, uh, seeing a game at the Emirates would be just a dream come true for me. And then probably just like the standard places in Europe. I'd love to see Paris. I'd love to see uh, Germany, like Munich, Berlin, two amazing cities, Portugal is Spain, like all the, all the big ones really in, in Western or, uh, yeah, Western Europe really, uh, interests me, but, uh, nothing like at the top of my list, like, Oh, I want this like one specific thing to do. I really just kind of want to see it all take it as much culture as I can and, uh, go from there. You got to save up a lot of money for that. All your yeah. uh, oh, time yeah. working at the golf course is this <laughs> yeah. summer. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Europe is unbelievable though. And seeing a game, like a soccer game there insane although yeah. i'm we're biased on that but uh seeing a soccer game there is insane Aiden, you may not enjoy it as much uh, i've i've been i told didn't i tell you um i went yeah. to a barcelona game a barcelona it was oh, exhibition yeah. exhibition barcelona still game. yeah can't, can't beat good. that yeah That's camp new yeah. yeah yeah well either way the you're very set in stone on what you plan to do which is <laughs> very admirable and um I wish I was like that. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, trust We're me, it still... took me a while to get here. Took me, like like I said, for three years, I had no freaking clue I wanted to do. And I finally now feel like comfortable in saying that. But yeah, I don't think that there shouldn't be any rush. The pandemic especially has made, in my opinion, just made things. You should take as much time as you need to figure your life out with the pandemic. Like, I don't think you can judge anyone for graduating and not having a clue on what they want to do. Because the job industry is confusing already with sport media or sport yeah. the sport industry and now it's 10 times even more confusing with with the pandemic so i i it's yeah confusing stuff i'm curious because you're very planned out what are you <laughs> doing for practicum and what's your plan for an internship uh for practicum i'm working on the girls got game uh practicum so that is the show that natasha ella kennedy elizabeth and emma de silva all work on uh so I'm joining them uh, because I, uh, I've i worked with Ella and Natasha a lot throughout this program, and I know I get along really well with them. So they're like, want to come on? I was like, of course I do. It sounds like an awesome thing. Plus, uh, you know, advocating for female representation in sports is something that I really hold true in my heart, uh, something that I've been an advocate for since day one. So that is uh, something that I, I'm very excited to work on. Uh, as far as internship, I ha honestly have not been looking into that too much yet. Um, Ideally, I'd love to work for maybe like an organization in their marketing department, MLSE marketing, uh, even for a company. 
like CCM marketing, something like that. Tailor made marketing. Yo, CCM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, anything <laughs> along those lines. That we have currently. <laughs> yeah. You know, Gotta blur it out. <laughs> <laughs> something along those lines. Uh, is like the dream scenario, but honestly, uh, who, who knows? I'll have to have to do a lot more research when it comes to that. Yeah. Right. I was going to say something. Oh yeah. It's cool that they're turning. Cause that was a podcast, right? Girls got yeah. game. That was a spirit live show. That's cool that they're turning that into, into a practicum. So mm -hmm. I'm interested to see where you guys go with that and hear the pitch and stuff. That'll be good. Yeah, I'm excited as well. Should be fun. Yeah. It's good to know you. Good to know that you actually know what you're doing. As a nice to hear with absolutely no clue. <laughs> no, I, what do you mean? I have, I have, I have clues. I have clues. You have clues. I have All a backup. Right. I have a backup. You have yeah. a backup. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always good to have a backup. Yeah. yeah. Of all things in life. Well, as Leaf signings continue to break, really, um, it's a couple of nobodies. But oh God, let's get into some of the stuff that you've done outside of Ryerson. Of kind of. Sure. It's sort of. It's affiliated. A lot yeah. of it. Uh, major thing is you're from Dundas, Ontario. You highlight that on every single one of your social medias. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> I like it's just I don't know. It's uh, it's one of those things. A lot of us have a lot of pride being from Dundas. I don't know what it is. Um, a lot of people go to university. Not to say like this is the case with you guys or anyone, but I just know like some people I'm friends with at university really don't like going back to their hometown. Don't really have many close friends there. I still have a great core group of friends here. Love coming back to the city. So. Yeah, I love to brag that I'm from Dundas. Um, probably a little bit too much, but yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> As a Torontonian, I don't know that feeling uh, because I've yeah. never. Left. But <laughs> let's start off with I think what you did. I'll ignore the YouTube page. We'll get there in a second. Yeah. Uh, because I didn't. You're welcome. I didn't watch any of the videos. Oh, I mean, it's all from uh, high school. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it was all high school. The couple videos from Sport Media, as yeah. I didn't click on it. Um, yeah, <laughs> you started the show with Kyle Cushman, as you mentioned, first you mentioned earlier, who's been on fire today, uh, with all the leaf stuff and Matt Mallard, yeah. uh, it's on hiatus, I guess is yeah. probably way of putting it. <laughs> um, I think we all kind of just, have gone our own ways now. Um, but I love both those guys. Like we're all still friends. I, I think just professionally or like recreationally we've all uh, got our, our own ways here we kind of all had different visions things along things along those lines but those were uh it's funny like the, at sport media orientation those were the two people we got partnered with and right away we just all clicked and had a had a great connection and like i said i still love those guys uh kyle's doing great stuff on youtube like the videos he's putting out and the stuff his twitter is absurd if if you if you care about anything to do with the leafs you have to follow kyle cushman and matt same thing. I think he, he's obviously a little bit more different of a follow. Um, Kyle's very analytical. Matt is very, not to say he doesn't delve into analytics, but he's very... Um, I test. I test kind of. I, he's more of a traditionalist, but again, I think you need that combination of both. I'm not someone who strictly sides with analytics or I test. Um, so I think they're both just very passionate Leaf fans who are, um, yeah, who are really good Twitter followers if you like the Leafs. And yeah, I uh, really great time on the KMN show. Anytime I do anything with Kyle or Matt, it's always a good time. So yeah, it was, it was a really great way to kick off, um, Ryerson. That's for sure. And you did it for a while too. You sort of stopped it last summer. Cause when we had Matt on our show, he was sort of saying he was probably going to take a step back, uh, mm -hmm. all the media stuff. Um, yeah. And, sorry. Yeah. Matt, cause Matt started like a, a graphic page as well like mm -hmm. recently too right so he's kind of taking a bit of a step aside i guess from sports in some way yeah i think for me and i think a lot of other people like i'm kind of tired out with sports right now i won't lie to you um i know I was, I was talking to matt a little bit but it's like i if i'm being honest after the leafs lost in the playoffs i barely watched any other games in the nhl playoffs i mean i have to go to bed at like eight every night because it's my schedule but uh <laughs> i on the weekends, like I had no desire to watch an NHL playoff game between like the Jets and Habs. I was like, I could not care less who wins this. And I think a lot of people maybe have felt that just because being inside for the past year, all I've done is watch sports, especially right. with our program completely evolved around sports. So I think for me and a lot of maybe a lot of other people, it's been nice this summer with to kind of take a step away from just being completely enamored with sports, completely, uh, you know, involved in sports all the time and kind of just enjoy some other things in life um like music movies entertainment stuff like that it's nice to nice to delve into those things as well 
Yeah, I felt that too, I think. I don't know about you, Connor, but I don't know if it's just like a sport media thing. Like, does every year kind of go through this? Like, after third year ends, like, they're kind of just a little bit tired of sports, but, or is it the Leafs loss? Or is it, yeah. um, or is it the pandemic? Like, mm-hmm. I think it's the industry though, because like industry? you listen to the professionals, like Bob McKenzie, well, Bob's a little different, but Friedman, CJ, all the people in sport media, the second free agency ends, they're gone. Yeah. They don't pay any attention to sports. Uh, and I think it's just a lot of burnout. This industry mm. is a whole lot of burnout. Um, and I think a lot of us have reached that point oh, and yeah. we're sort of discovering like what burnout really is like. Um, and it's not fun. <laughs> Put it mildly, but I guess you just got to keep grinding. Uh, but you didn't just do the KMN show. Yeah. Another thing you did with Matt uh, and I think Kyle as well. The year five collective. Yeah. I'm not gonna list every single person because we've done that on so many shows at this point. It's not even funny. Yeah, yeah. You guys do yeah, research. I, I like this. Very oh, yeah. thorough. Well, <laughs> yeah, I Connor does it. it. Connor does all the research. <laughs> yeah. Uh you'll probably notice I clicked on your LinkedIn page. Please update it. It's great. I, I've you. not been on LinkedIn yeah. in so long. <laughs> no. That's the primary place where I get all my information. Is yeah, everybody I, I, stuff? My but, dad told me that the other day. He's like, have you touched this in two years? I'm like, no. He's like, if you want to get a job soon, you should probably do that. I'm like, yeah, it's probably a good point. I probably should. Yeah. It's also, it's so helpful for people who have popular names. Yeah. Uh, oh, like yeah. We had Jack Shapiro, as I mentioned <laughs> earlier. There yeah, were yeah. so many Jack Shapiros. I couldn't find anything he did. So I <laughs> Yeah. So just all- update it so Connor can do more research on you. That's exactly what yeah. he's trying to say yeah. here. Jack, if you want to come on the show, update your LinkedIn. Okay. Hey, I'll tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but your five collective, yep. it's kind of dead at this point. Yeah. It was a fun point. time at the yeah. time. Um, that was kind of right after. So how I look at it was like, we, we finished first year and our excitement for sport media was here. And we just wanted to keep it going in the summer. No one wanted to stop. And we're like, why don't we make this journalism website? We can just all post some stuff. I think I only posted like two articles um, or three articles, but it was fun. Um, it was a way for all of us to kind of, like I said, everyone's excitement with sport media was just at an all time high, especially after, you know, first or first semester of second year, you don't really do anything with sports other than, um, creative practices or whatever it was called creative you know what i'm talking about Um, the creative writing class basically that's the only one that's like geared towards sports maybe no wait first semester of second year no first semester first year oh sorry second year my apologies yeah yeah you're right yeah first to first yep for sure uh creative whatever it is that's the only one that's geared towards sports creative processes creative processes thank you and then second semester you delve into all these sport related classes and i think everyone's excitement was just so high and it's like oh my god it's so dope i love this program that we kind of just wanted to keep the high going uh so yeah we started that i honestly cannot take a lot of credit for it i was kind of just the idea was brought to me uh and i just started writing some stuff that i found interesting and uh yeah uh it is it is very much not a thing really anymore but it was like i said for that summer it was uh definitely a fun little little uh venture we did and obviously there's a lot of good content on there. Uh, podcasts from everything. Speaking of podcasts, you did, you've done two more, which we'll talk about. Uh, but the first one, three guys talk about soccer. Yeah. You oh, did yeah. One episode with Nick and Simon. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> one episode. That was, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, that was kind of just like, none of us were like really prepared and we were just like, we had a lot going on. That was, I believe second semester, second year. And I think we we're all just overwhelmed. We we're like, this isn't going to work. But two guys who I do love talking about soccer or football with are Nick and Simon. So uh, anytime, you know, th- it, it was a fun one episode. That's what I can say about that. That's for sure. So you guys just did it like on your own or did you do it with uh, like Spirit Live? Uh, I think it was with Spirit Live. Yeah. Oh, no, it was a uh, podcast. I see. Yeah, it was okay, a podcast, okay. not a radio show. We should have done a radio show because then it would have forced us to show right. up every week. But we yes. didn't. So, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that ever going to? Yeah, oh, you have a radio. Yeah, do you have a radio show with Spirit Live? Is that what you're gonna say, Connor? Or no? <laughs> no, but I, 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 so. <laughs> then go ahead. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say, do you have all your creative practice hours? 
at this point? Uh, yeah, I've done, I did the KMN for, I want to say like four semesters, which alone gets me like close to 40 and I've done pff, at least 20 Rams live games. So I think I'm well and clear on, uh, on spirit Lab. I haven't handed or, uh, creative practice hours. I haven't handed any of them in yet, which I think is the case for most people. Cause you kind of have to wait till fourth year to like really get them in i have all them ready i just gotta um, submit them or have you, you, have them you been... digitally now remember yeah. oh, right okay so i gotta get those in soon because they're all ready to go um but yeah i think i probably have close to maybe 100 150 with all the stuff Jeez. i've done so yeah so that's I, really impressive I, I, I really like rams live games it's a lot and you get free pizza so it, you really cannot go wrong <laughs> like all worth it for the free pizza exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> What what roles did you do? Uh, uh, I I've done a little bit of everything. Uh, my favorite roles have been audio. I really like CG. Um, replays fun, but also very scary at the same time. Uh, camera. A lot of people, you know, slag on camera. I don't hate it. I think it's a lot of fun filming a game. Uh, especially if you're like camera one or two for a hockey game, that's a lot of fun. Right, not you don't the want to be three or four. No, yeah, no, you do not want the shoulder cams. That's yeah, uh, no fun. Uh, but yeah, those have probably been my favorite rules. Um, yeah, but I think Rams Live is just such a great opportunity, and I like I think everyone in our program should really take advantage of it because it's such a great time. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I, you're talking to one person. How many? I don't know how many shows or uh, events you've done. I've done zero. Oh. Uh, <laughs> if, if there was a radio version of Rams Live, I think Connor would be leading the program oh, now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It would yeah. not even be funny. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it terrifies me. Uh, Three hundred hours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm currently I think an hour or two off a of sixty. So, yeah, you're yeah. close. Same. Yeah. Figure out something for fourth year. Do another. Uh, hopefully, Spirit Live brings us back. Spirit Live, please, please bring us back. Um, <laughs> if you're listening, please, yeah, bring you're listening. Back. <laughs> please bring us back. Um, but final show. You sort of started this semi recently. The Payout Scouts. Oh yeah, that <laughs> is fun. That is a lot of fun. Uh, I am a so-called uh, self-proclaimed degenerate gambler not really just one football season's in full swing and that's really when the podcast like ran it was kind of hard to do a, a weekly show without football football is the perfect betting schedule you have a week full of games you can talk about each one very simple to understand for most people uh so yeah uh i i like gambling maybe a little bit too much sometimes but i'm never afraid to put a little bit of money on anything and uh so yeah, I, I figured why not talk about some some gambling stuff with two of my two of my peers, and that's what that ended up being. It was a really good first season. Undecided for coming back for season two, but uh, if we are, I'll be sure to let everyone know. <laughs> you got to come back because I've lost a lot of money this summer yeah, <laughs> from <damn> gambling. <laughs> so as, as you I need some okay. advice. What sports? What is the worst sport to bet on, in your opinion? Because I have an opinion. Uh, yeah, I would say the worst sport to bet on is hockey. It's, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah it's it's cool. hockey. Like, I've been so confident on hockey bets before, and I've been screwed over. Football, you like with the spread, you can get screwed over, but money line, you're usually there's usually a, a clear cut winner, clear cut loser. Hockey, I mean, I I bet on. I remember this game last year. It was when Detroit got outshot like through two periods they were being outshot like 40 to 8 and they ended up winning the game uh detroit because they had like 16 shots in the third period against carolina and i bet on carolina that game in a parlay and i was just like i'm done with betting on hockey for a bit because detroit had like one third of the shots that carolina just had and i lost my bet so i i yeah but hockey is like not even close for me yeah. hockey is so bad to bet on secretly good sport to bet on conca calf soccer i okay I haven't been betting on uh, Gold Cup, but I'd love to hear the rationale on on why it is. The odds are always unbelievably bad. Really? Like, yeah, it's insane. Um, well, I remember this. I always use this, this example, but there was a game between Haiti and somebody else, and Haiti literally had like eleven players and no oh, goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah, that was at, in in the Gold Cup with COVID, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they still had whoever they were playing like dominica or whatever mm -hmm. at like positive odds like it was like 1.36 or something really to beat haiti it was a, it's yeah. a joke 
they don't pay that's, attention. They don't pay attention. Yeah, I mean that's why like some people talk about it's like oh you gotta get into like Russian ping pong and stuff like that because like I I was watching a YouTube video and it's like they make these lines for all these Russian ping pong games, but like anyone can win, but there's always a clear cut favorite and a clear cut loser, and like the losers like plus two hundred, so like two or three to one odds that this guy could win. And it's like if you place ten bets on the underdog, you're gonna win like four of them, and you'll make your money back. And it's like, maybe I gotta get into Russian ping pong. I don't know, but <laughs> I love Concacaf soccer. I love oh, it. It's great. Can't beat it. Cannot I, beat it. I make my money on Concacaf soccer and lose it all on MLS and NHL. It's oh, crazy. MLS is a brutal one as well. It's so bad. Yeah, it's so unpredictable and just stupid at this. Yeah. I, only I, the only confident one team I'm am and when it comes to betting is Seattle Sounders money line. Yeah. Because they never lose. They they do never lose. No, it's true. So it, there's your advice. If you're betting if you want to bet on MLS, do Seattle. Uh, <laughs> which could get better now that the Roll Don brothers are potentially coming back, depending mm-hmm. on what happens in the next week. Uh but final sort of live thing, then we'll talk a bit about your YouTube page so people can go and find it and watch all your cringy videos because Sounds it's good. always fun. Uh, and unfortunately, I scrolled through your Instagram tagged pictures, and there was no good content. It's very frustrating. I, uh, I've blocked. I've untagged myself from all the ones I don't want people to see me in. I'm sorry. I, I'm one step ahead of you. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're just <laughs> evil. Evil. That's where I get all my good content. Um, but you do uh, Matt and Nigel live. I don't know how yeah. often you do this. Aiden, you threw this in the doc. I yeah. forgot. To yeah. Could you tell us a bit about Matt and Nigel live? Yes. So Matt was kind of just like, I kind of want to talk hockey, but like not like to be forced to talk about it every week. And I was like, I'm down. Um, so he's like, whatever we feel like talking, we'll just whip this up. Uh, and so that's really what it is. It's just like, if we want to talk about something, I'm sure we'll maybe do an episode soon with the free agency. That hasn't been a lot to talk about recently. Uh, but yeah, we just talk about the Leafs. Um, I kind of just like talking hockey with Matt because he says some stuff that cracks me up sometimes in like the nicest way possible, as in like, He's just so like passionate and intense. I mean, you guys know Matt. Uh, yeah. So he says some funny stuff, and I, I just like being a part of it. I kind of take a back seat and let Matt uh, do most of the talking there, and I'm kind of just there for a funny quip here and there. And, uh, yeah, but it's a lot of fun. And, yeah, like I said, talking hockey with Matt, Kyle, any of those guys, it's always a fun time. Yeah, yeah. I tuned in to, I think it was, um, I guess, like their post-mortem um, <laughs> episode. I, I don't know yeah. how long that was, maybe like an hour and a half or something like that. Um, it was really good. But what, what what made you guys decide to put it on Twitch? Because I guess when people start a podcast, it's like either Spotify or YouTube. But yeah. why, did, why did you guys uh, pick Twitch? Well, we were saying like, we kind of just want to talk and like not have to like record it or worry about putting it anywhere. Just like, we can just go here, talk the recording we can save from Twitch and then put it wherever we want. Um, and yeah, Twitch is like really, I, it's really growing with like the talk show, uh, industry for sports, especially with COVID and, um, Streamlabs I find really simple to use. And that's coming from someone who like doesn't understand computers at all. So, um, I was like, I can easily set this up for us. And it's just an easy way to be able to, you know, kind of have like a live like spirit live show but from from your own house um by twitch so yeah that was that was interesting uh a little different way to do it i guess yeah i think it's a really cool idea yeah you guys should keep keep it up yeah i'm looking you should get you guys should definitely do a free agency one because yeah a couple, i'm sure, we, I'm couple sure signing. yeah mm-hmm. so keep an eye out for that next week i guess uh, or this weekend who knows uh but let's talk the youtube page Okay, I, I don't honestly know what's on here. So let's let's yeah, talk. What is on it? <laughs> Let me I'll copy the link and I'll put it into our I, shared sports notes doc. Okay. Uh, it's right at the top for you next to notes. You have to send him a link to get into his own YouTube page. I I, I <laughs> you know I could just look is it just Nigel Gebection? I think so. I, don't I know, man. the link. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, Wait. some quality on here. Quality content. What I want to like know to talk about <laughs> the what the one? business video. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So this, this is actually kind of like a coincides with sport media. So I had this amazing teacher in high school. His name is Mr. Toth. Um, and he was a business guy. And I, like I said, I'm, I love business. I've taken a lot of business classes in university, taken a lot of business classes in high school. Um, and he was really like, 
he basically was like, Najee, you're so good at articulating with your voice, but when you write stuff down, you always leave out detail. And that's always been my problem. I'm really I'm a good communicator, but when it comes to writing, I I, I hate writing. Not my not my favorite thing. Mm-hmm. So he's like, why don't you just record your assignments and hand them in that way and just talk? And so he let me do that, wow. um, which is a really like legendary move from the guy. Yeah. So that's what all those videos are. Um, yeah. And he kind of really was like, you're so like, he really pushed me to go to sport media and was like, you, you're so good at communicating. This is like the right thing for you. And um you shouldn't do business. Like don't settle for that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, big shout out to Mr. Toth, like a big influence on me in high school. And I, th- yeah, he, he just let me record all my stuff, which was awesome because who wants to write like a thousand words when you can just talk for like 15 minutes. It's, it's perfect. Like <laughs> more teachers have to do that. Yeah. yeah. I know more teachers do have to do that. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would have gotten a lot better grades. I think if if they, if they let me uh, if they let me talk instead of write, it would have been easier. To, is it? Well, I guess it's easier work too because you just have to like set up the camera, record, just yeah, kind of talk. I, or did I you have just, a script? I would make some notes, uh, right. just so I was ready, so I wasn't like rambling too much, and then I would just go off of those. And yeah, he loved it, and like all my friends were like, I should do this. And then they would do it. And he'd be like, it's just not the same. And I'd be like, ah, sorry guys. Like, <laughs> it's just not the same. Like, it's like, I'm, ah, I'm just the guy for it, I guess. But yeah, no, Mr. Toth legend. Um, shout out to him. I know he's definitely not listening, but yeah, great. One of the, probably the best teacher I ever had. So high praise for him. Shout out that guy. And probably about half the amount of work as it would take to write it. A- oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. For, for sure. That- thousand word essay or whatever yeah. uh if you want to go check out nigel's business projects from uh high school you can go yeah. view that you also got to have a couple sport media videos up there um yeah. as well uh so go check him out subscribe he has one subscriber now two um yes <laughs> we go with three That's amazing let's go I'll subscribe on the big league there you go yeah. thanks there you subscribers. go <laughs> Uh, so we'll put that below for all of you to enjoy that content. Uh, but without further ado, unless we've missed anything blatant and you go at me for my research skills, let's talk some hockey. Let's. And we need to start with this. Big, big signing just now, yeah. Mike Hoffman has agreed to a three-year, $4.5 million per contract with the Montreal Canadiens. Canadian. Obviously, Canadians have been in the news, not for good reasons, uh, which we won't get into because that's a crap franchise. But what do you guys think about this Hoffman extension or extension contract? Too much money, too long. Do you like Hoffman as a player? Obviously, he's had some not good things follow him around uh, in the past. What do yeah. you sort of stand on Hoffman? We won't do this for every signing. We're just doing this because it just broke like this second. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the fit in Montreal. Uh, I guess it worked last year signing a veteran goal scorer in Corey Perry. Obviously, is a much bigger commitment, uh, a lot more AAV. But he is a very, very good power play scorer. And without Shea Weber on the power play now for maybe ever, uh, you, you have a, a spot where you're going to need shots on the power play. So... I think it's a decent signing for that sense. I don't know if I'm in love with the 4.5 over three, uh, but I think, I, you know, I think Montreal could use more goal scoring. I mean, that's there's no no denying that. You saw them in the, the Stanley Cup. They were struggling to score goals. Nick Suzuki, Cole Caulfield, you know, Yoel Armia can only do so much. Uh, and, I mean, Philippe Deneau, who was, you know, wasn't scoring a lot of goals but was setting up a lot of them, is gone now. So you need a little bit more offensive uh, power, and I think I think this is a solid signing for the Habs. Yeah. So for the other, sorry to get you off in, but for the other signings, we'll do just good, bad, because yeah. otherwise we'll be talking. Yeah, for we'll be talking hours. forever. Uh, but Aiden, quickly, what do you think of Hoffman? I mean, I personally am a pretty big fan of of Mike Hoffman as a player. Like, like, like Nigel said, like power play specialist, but I think he's also like a pretty good goal scorer, five on five as well. Um, and yeah, like Montreal, like the reason why they weren't able to like push through and win the cup this year was pro- primarily the offense. They just couldn't get enough goals. Um, and just to add another guy who can fit it in probably their top six, or you can move him to the third line and just provides more depth scoring depth throughout the lineup. 
it reminds me a lot of the Tyler Toffoli signing. You know, you last season, we didn't really expect Montreal to go out and get a scorer like Toffoli mm -hmm. and spending the money on him. This kind of seems kind of like exactly like it. They just need more of it. Um, I don't think the contract is going to like bite them at all. Like it's, three years is okay. Like he's 31 years old. He'll be out of there at 34. You can probably trade the contract if you wanted to at some point as well, if things go south. Um, but considering like Hyman gets 5.5, Coleman got 4.9. Yeah. I don't mind 4.5 for probably the, the guy who will score more goals than both Coleman and Hyman as well. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go actually focused on the Leafs. Uh, because all three of us are Leafs fans, and this is a Leafs podcast, basically. Uh, but we'll also mention some notable former Leafs who left or signed big deals and then run through other signings quickly and all that fun stuff. We're not talking about Seth Jones. I don't want to talk about Seth Jones, and I don't want to talk about Tony D'Angelo either because he's a terrible person. But big signing before broke before free agency, so I don't know how that happened without tampering being involved. Same thing with the player that we're going to talk about next, but Leafs got a new uh, starting backup one, a one B goalie, Peter Morazic mm -hmm. three years, 3.8 per. Uh, what do you think about the contract too much, too little? Do you like Peter Morazic splitting the net with Jack Campbell? Uh, and do you see this being a successful fit with Morazic in Toronto? I personally like I like the term. I like the money. Uh, I don't think it's too much or too little. I think it's like ballpark. I thought someone like Mrazek would be getting around four to four point two. So I think I think all the goalies kind of got slightly less than I was anticipating, though. So clearly, it's not the greatest market if you're a goalie. Like I thought, Grubauer was going to be getting like seven plus, and he only got like five point nine. So, um, but anyways, I, I like the sign for Toronto. I think having the one A one B. I don't know who's going to be who, but Campbell and Mrazek. You have two. Uh, Brazic's a proven NHL starting caliber goalie. Jack Campbell had an incredible season last year. I think he can continue, not maybe up to like the ridiculous win loss ratio, but I think he'd have another good year. And you're also going to a guy, Mrazic, who's a proven big game performer. I heard them saying that on the broadcast today. Uh, I believe it was Jeff O'Neill, maybe, but Mrazic's been great in big games his whole career. And that's something that the Leafs have definitely not had with goaltending over the past few seasons with Freddie Anderson or with Jack Campbell in game seven this year. So I think Mrazic's great signing. The one a one B system is the system that a lot of teams are trying to use. It hasn't really won a cup yet. It, it has been the fact that like one goalie just goes out and plays amazing. So I'm sure playoff time, you're going to see one goalie getting majority of the starts, but I think on paper, this is a really great move by the Leafs. Yeah, that's the thing I'm kind of going back and forth like between like, do you need that like stud elite goalie, like a clear number one, or can the tandem win you like a cup? Like that's yeah. what the Leafs are trying to go after. Can that win you a Stanley Cup? And if a tandem can work, then I think we have a pretty good tandem. You know, it doesn't matter if Campbell's the starter or Mrazek's the starter. I think they can go out there and win you games. Um, I think the the prime example would have been like a, a Murray Flurry, like that worked out perfectly. They won back to back cups, but the thing is, like, is Mrazek and Campbell the same caliber uh, of of goalies as as Murray and Flurry? I'm not sure. They have the potential to be, but I'm not too sure about that. Also, the thing with Campbell is, can he stay healthy like throughout the entire year if he is the clear starter? Um, but I, in terms of Mrazek, I like the signing. I like the term. Um, at first I thought the price was a little bit high. Like I wanted it to be like three flat. Um, but I think 3.8 is, is doable. It's okay. Three years. Um, maybe he becomes a starter and you lose Campbell next year or something. I don't know. Um, but I like it. They really had to add a, another goalie to, to back up Campbell. Um, so I, I like the move and he's making less than Freddie, which is nice. And he has better numbers than Freddie in the last two seasons, at least. So that's a plus. I like the signing, especially considering it uh, to other contracts that were handed out today, specifically Jonathan Bernier and his big deal. Um, but I actually like the 1A, 1B, because what the Leafs have always struggled with is their goalies have always sucked in the playoffs. Yeah, And this gives you two options who could potentially suck in the playoffs or a backup plan in the event one player doesn't play well. Uh, and I think it's... It's what the Leafs want. I think it's a manageable number. 
it'll be interesting to see what the Leafs do next off season with Campbell because he's expiring. Uh, but maybe they bring him back. I don't know. Uh, I think today it came out that Campbell has deactivated his Instagram and Twitter. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I think I saw that on Twitter. So we'll probably have to keep an eye on that. I don't know what that'll mean, but a little zero dark 23, like LeBron in the playoffs gets off social media. I like that. He's, he's dialed in for the next season. Yeah. For the next season, just Big things no coming. social media for Big the next year. Coming. Yeah. There you go. Uh, but we'll see what a tandem looks like between Peter Mrazek and uh, Jack Campbell. The next big move they made, which broke last night, sort of Michael Bunting, which I think everybody could see coming from about 10,000 kilometers away. Um, <laughs> former Sue Greyhound played oh. with, uh, I think both Dubis and Keefe yeah. 25, two years, 900 K or 950 K. I'm not really sure. Friedman and McKenzie had two different numbers, uh, but either way, 50 K difference, not yeah. a big deal. Uh, that's a big deal. That's a good contract in my I, opinion. I, I, yeah. Um, especially with like what David Kampf got from the Leafs, like 18 hours later, or like technically like four hours later, which is a terrible contract if, not to spoil that yet. But, uh, yeah, nine K for a guy in 21 games last year at 10 goals, uh, incredible in front of the net presence. Um, very just a good in front of the net presence. That's where most of his goals came from with tips, deflections, or rebounds. Uh, I like it a lot for the Leafs. They need a guy like that on their fourth line, I think, other than like Wayne Simmons. Uh, but Michael Bunting can actually skate. So I think yeah. it's a good deal. Um, and yeah, a little bit of nepotism with the Sue Greyhound thing, but clearly Dubas and Keith love their Greyhounds. So yeah, but I, I think it's a good deal for the Leafs. Yeah, I think it's a really good deal as well. Um, yeah, it's it's tough to judge him though because like he I guess like once the signing happens, people will say like he's he could fit into your top six. Like he's a top six winger. He's not. I don't no. think he is. No, 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 no. Cause because yeah. like he's played 26 NHL games. Yeah. Like he he's an AHL player basically. Um yeah, he had a phenomenal season last year, I guess, putting up like 10 goals in 21 games. Can he keep that up? with like a 28% shooting percentage. Probably not. There's no way he keeps that up. Um, he's a good player though. Like he's fast, obviously he's physical. He's gritty. Um, from the highlights that I've seen, he has a pretty good shot as well. Um, so he can probably like finish a lot of opportunities that they get, but I think he's like the, the ideal third line left winger for the Leafs um, at 900 K or 950 K. It's, it's a steal. It's a great, mm -hmm. great contract. Where do you see him slotting in then? Without uh, bias of what you think he is, do you think he's top six or do you think he is that third liner? No, he's. I I cannot see that. Like unless he he comes out and starts scoring an incredible amount of goals, I cannot see him topping. Sorry, pardon me, cracking the least top six. Um, I'm not sure who they're gonna put with Matthews and Marner yeah. at this, or if they even keep Matthews and Marner together because obviously they lost Hyman. But I'm not sure who's gonna slot into that new left wing spot on the first line. If it's someone like Alex Kerfoot, if they go out and sign another center, if it's a free agent who's yet to be signed, Thomas Tatar is still someone who's out there who is an interesting person who I'd take a swing on probably for not a lot of money because he had a pretty brutal year last year. Um yeah. I think but from Michael Bunting's perspective, I think he's a bottom six guy. Maybe he cracks in the top six here and there, but I think he is pretty much staying in the bottom six as a ceiling i would say yeah i don't know i like i think like it's tough i think he's a guy that can kind of play up and down your lineup but then again like i'm saying that knowing that he's only played 26 nhl games he doesn't yeah. have a resume it's it's too hard to judge this guy um people are saying he's he's a late bloomer potentially but i don't know maybe you give him a shot with with Tavares and Nylander at some point um but i think to start at least He's on he's on the third line, I think. I think he's third line left wing. Um probably fighting for for that spot with with Mikheyev. I disagree. I think he starts with Matthews and Marner as the Hyman replacement. I hey I, yeah. and give it to them and just get to the front of the net because I think he's <laughs> ideal for that sort of situation. And at nine hundred K, he's very cheap. Also, the Leafs have way too many third line left wingers. 
So somebody's got to move up. And, I think move it's up. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of third line left wingers, potentially Curtis Gabriel one year, 750 K. What do you think about this deal? Bruiser really good off the ice. He's very vocal oh, and yeah. social issues, stuff like that. Yep. Do you think this is a very good hockey decision though? Uh, I do not think like I saw, I think Kush tweeted or someone tweeted. It's like, he's going to play like the Scott Saborin role of like, he might come into like a game here or there, but I can't see him being a regular fixture and, and at least, but I love the signing because Curtis Gabriel is a tremendous, uh, flint, not flint, is maybe not the word, but role model and, uh, activist for LGBTQ rights within hockey. Uh, and inclusivity within hockey. So from that perspective, absolutely love him being a part of the Toronto Maple Leafs organization. Uh, on the ice, though, not sure he really is going to have a massive role for the Leafs next year. But uh, yeah, I think he's just a great guy to have around in the locker room and brings a really positive uh, light to to the Leafs uh, environment next season. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, from, from a hockey perspective, like... Just looking at the depth that we have right now, maybe he does crack the fourth line. Like if this is the team and they want to have more of a physical presence on the fourth line, uh, a guy who's going to be vocal on the ice, who's going to be in your face on the ice, maybe that's kind of the way that they could go with that fourth line. Maybe he starts on fourth line left wing. Um, and I think it's a one-way contract as well. So maybe the Leafs do have some plans of, of just keeping him around and, because he'd have to go through waivers. He's probably not going to get claimed on waivers if they do have to put him through that. Um, but maybe the Leafs do have a plan to say, like, hey, we're going to give you a shot in training camp to, to make the roster, to make the team, and, and we'll see what happens there. He's not a terrible hockey player. Like, he can skate, like, okay. Um, and, he, and, he's, and he's physical. They, they have been lacking some physicality in, in past years, so maybe he, maybe he can add to it. All right. Next player will go to previously mentioned by Nigel, David, David Kampf. Yeah. I know you automatically aren't a massive fan of it. I'm okay with it because I think he is your new third line center. And I think your third line becomes a checking line. Yeah. He just provides like literally zero offensive upside. I think he is a very good, def not very good in a, in a slightly above average defensive center who is very good at face-offs, which I don't look into too much. Cause I think it's an overrated thing to look into, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, I just, I don't like, I think again, I think Kush tweeted it like Nick Bonino got like the same amount of money pretty much. And Nick Bonino is a way better player than David camp. I just, if the, if the money wasn't as big, I would be on board with it a bit more, I think. But the fact that you're committing 1.5 to this guy seems for a little two years, two, for two years, years as well. And it's not going to be something you can just easily get off of. Cause who wants, unless, and Hey, I could be wrong. Um, but from what I've understand and what I've, you know, looking at the J fresh, uh, player card for him i mean his finishing is 10 percentile in the nhl not great his penalty killing is 82 percent, so that's obviously very good but <clears throat> other than that uh you get a guy who just has defensive upside and not a lot offensively i like the least to go for guys who are a little bit of both but i can understand based off of last year and the collapse they had going for a little more reassurance on your bottom six defensively Connor, what's your ideal third line then? If if Camp is the third line center, who who is who's on the wing? Well, I think you go all out. They're not scoring a single goal, but nothing's happening when they're on the ice. So I put Ilya Mikheyev out there too, uh, <laughs> and then I think I put like maybe Gabriel. Maybe I don't Whoa. think I think higher in the lineup. Uh, maybe Engvall potentially. I don't yeah. know. What I do like about the camp signing, though, he's a center who can play on the penalty kill. And yeah. the Leafs have had that since Par Lindholm. Yeah, yeah. So, that's fair. And he wasn't very good on the penalty kill as well. No. Curtis David Gabe, Clement. Yeah. David Camp will be. Yeah. And I think that's a good sign. And I think that was desperately needed. I also think the Leafs are going to make a move. 
Yeah, I think they got to still. They're, 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 this is not the team they're going to walk into October 15th or whenever it is opening night. There's still, in my opinion, lots. I think there's lots of players now who will not be on the lease come October 15th. Um, yeah. yeah. One of I, which name I just said in Ilya Mikheyev. I agree. Right. Yeah. But as much as I love Ilya Mikheyev, he just like his value is definitely somewhat inflated. I think, and he provides like l- just no- nothing offensively. Um, solid defensive player, solid, a very fast skater, which is attractive to a lot of teams, I guess. But you could just get so much more value, in my opinion, of a third line winger than what you have with Ilya Mikheyev. Yeah, I agree with that too. I, th- I also think Kerfoot might might be gone too. I, th- I just don't like the cap hit. And the Leafs are working with like, I think, 1.6 mil right now. You can't really get much with that. So you no. got to free up something like, like uh, I want them to trade Riley. I think that's the, I think that's the move you trade Riley now. Cause it's going to be the exact same thing that happens next year um, with Riley. Then it, then like it did this year with Hyman, you're just going to lose him for nothing. He's going to go away and you're not going to get I anything back gonna happen again. But I, I, think, I, yeah, no, even if he does walk, I, I don't think there's a sense trading your top, pairing defenseman for something now where you could run it back and try like let's be honest like if the Leafs don't blow that lead to Montreal no one gives a crap that Morgan Riley didn't have a great postseason but because he didn't have a great postseason everyone's quick to say oh let's get off Morgan Riley Morgan Riley's in my opinion still a hell of a defenseman who had a very tough season last year um he's proven in Toronto that he can be a good defenseman um I don't see the value in getting rid of him for like a couple draft picks or uh, there's basically, I don't think there's yeah. anyone you can trade Morgan Riley for who is going to make this team better right now. I think you have to go out with your best lineup for next year. And as much as the cap hit, it fle- frees up a bit of cap space. I don't think whoever you bring in is going to be as effective in the lineup as what Morgan Riley is. Personally, I, I don't know what Kyle Davis has up his sleeve. Maybe he has something crazy, but I think, I think you got to run it back with the same group again, pretty much because that team was too good to get eliminated in the first round. And I think they're even more hungry now. You would hope obviously than than, yeah. than prior years. I think we see a Kerfoot to Arizona trade with potentially Christian Dvorak coming back the other way. Because if you look at Dvorak's contract, he is very back loaded and Kerfoot is very front loaded. Front loaded. Yeah. So that seems like the ideal Arizona contract. Uh, and I think potentially with maybe some retention, it makes a bit more sense for the Leafs. And he's a potential third line center or top line left winger uh, option for them. I'm hesitant on the Riley thing. I think if you don't have an extension going into the season, you do trade him because the defenseman prices right now are just a joke. Um, Rasmus versus the line and getting a first, a second, and uh Robert no, is it Robert Hag? Yeah, Robert yeah, Hag. yeah. Yeah. Um I think that's a joke, and I think you can get a lot of value for him. But who knows? Other players, speaking of defensemen that they signed, Alex Biega and Carl Dalstrom. This broke as we were recording. Uh both signed seven hundred and fifty thousand bucks. Both are two-way contracts. Do you see them as being ahead of or behind Timothy uh, Lilligren? I'd say behind. <clears throat> I think these are just depth pieces. I, Lilligren's, for me, is a guy who's got to be in the NHL next year. Um, his skating ability, his offensive ability, along with also it's just his puck moving ability is something that the Leafs <clears throat> really can't uh, take for granted. What, and I think as much as you want to shelter a guy, at some point you do have to throw him into the deep end. And I think um, losing someone like Zach Bogosian really – I think it's an underrated loss because I think that really does hurt the Leafs defense a bit. Um, so I think, yeah, I think Lilligan should be starting day one. I think these are good death pieces if we have some injuries or something along those lines, but I don't see them starting come come October. Yeah, I don't see them starting either. I, I like that they're adding more depth on on defense. Um, they have to now that they, they lost Bogosian and like looking at that contract that Bogosian signed as well, like 800 K for three years. I wish the Leafs like got in on that and offered him like, I would take a mill, a mill for three years or something like that. I think you do what you can to get him back and be that solid right-handed defenseman on your bottom pair. Um, but you got to move past it now. 
Um, I agree with Nigel. I think you you have to give Liljegren more of a look this year. Like he's just been sitting in the minors for a healthy scratch for the past few seasons. They have to give him a shot. Same with Sandine as well. I, I hope he's like a lock. But then again, you just signed Travis Dermott to over a mil. So he's got to crack the lineup as well. So one of the three of them will be sitting on the bench. Mm-hmm. I think Dermot is part of that Arizona trade. I theorize. Let's hope. Let's hope because I want him out. I've been saying it for a while. I, I I'm Dermot a big out. Travis Dermot fan, but I he is very expendable. I think he's a great defenseman, and I would not be upset if he was getting minutes over someone like Tim- Timothy Logan. But at the same time, his contract is very attractive for teams to take on. Not a big cap hit, and he's young. I can see why he would be in any trade that that it, to a place like Arizona, very attractive piece for sure. All right, another defenseman the Leafs acquired, but via trade, they acquired the rights to John Merrill. Played in the KHL last season. He was second in KHL scoring for defensemen behind Montreal Canadiens signing Chris Weidman. What do you think about this trade? The conditional seventh rounder does go to Minnesota if he plays 30 games. I, I don't um, think it's it's not John Merrill. It's like, yeah, it's uh. John it's Brennan Mennell. Brennan Mennell. Brennan Mennell. Mennell. Put the wrong name. Yeah. I, no, it's all good. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I've never heard of this guy in my life. So I, yeah. it, it's a good death addition, I guess. Um, I don't see him playing 30 games for least next year. That's for sure. Um, yeah. Never heard of him until today. But same. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I was looking at his, I think his hockey DB earlier. I don't think he's played many NHL games. I don't think he has a point yet. Like five. I think he's played five. Yeah, he's played five NHL games. He's 24 years old. He, uh, yeah, z- zero points in those five games as well. Um, he's going to be like the, what, ninth or tenth defenseman, I guess. I, I don't know why Kyle's looking for He's 5'10 as well. He's 5'10. Like, <laughs> we don't need a small guy on the back end. It's like David Warsawski. <laughs> okay, David Warsawski is a career <laughs> who was in his 30s. Jo- uh, Brendan Mar- I, I, In terms of height, I mean. Uh, in terms of height. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this guy's at least 24. Uh, yeah. I don't know how much. I guess so, yeah. Who knows? Uh, but final player, we'll, well, we have two more players to talk about. Uh, first one being Michael Amadio. Can anybody tell me anything about this guy, apart from the fact that he signed a one-year, two-way deal at 750000 bucks? I think it's uh, pronounced Amadio. Yeah, it's my, I believe it's Amadio. Um, Amadio. He, okay. <laughs> he is a solid death piece for the Leafs. I liked him on the Kings. Uh, he wasn't too great last, just looking at his stats last year. Didn't really do much. 66, pardon me, 68 game. pardon me, sorry. Last year, 20 games played, only two points. The year before those 68 games played, 16 points. The year before that, he had 13 points in 43 games. I think he's a very solid death piece with the Leafs. Um, very solid uh, defensive underlying numbers. A bigger guy. Um, there's nothing you can really go wrong. And another former Sioux Greyhound. So there you have that. Not, not former Sioux Greyhound. He played for the U15 Sioux Greyhounds and was born in Sault Ste. Marie. Never played mm. for the Greyhounds. Oh, though. pardon me. You're right. That was his. Yeah. Okay. Well, kind of almost just a former <laughs> Sioux <laughs> Greyhound. I'll count it for that. But uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, again, a 700K contract. Very low risk, ro- low reward. Uh, low risk, potentially high reward signing. Um, so I have no complaints with that. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like at best fourth line guy, but like it's it's good. it'll help. It's it's always good to have depth. Um, I think he provides some physicality to the lineup as well, and uh, he can score at least six goals. So it's it's something. <laughs> All right. Well, final player we'll mention because. It's not really that big a deal, but he's probably the next Alex Galchenyuk, potentially. Josh Hosang is going to sign on a PTO for training camp. Do you think he gets a contract, and do you think he factors into the Leafs this season? Yes. I, Josh Hosang it has been the arguably one of the most frustrating things to watch as an NHL fan over the last like four years. What the New York Islanders organization did to him was completely wrong. I th- I honestly think, and I've said this before, if 
and it, I think racism does come into play with it. I think if he was white, he would be giving much more op- much more of an opportunity than what he was. But because he's an Asian hockey player, he was given a very short opportunity. And because he had some attitude problems, he was just shipped to the AHL, even the uh, ECHL for a little bit. But Josh Hosing, you cannot deny that he, that guy has goal-scoring touch. In the OHL, I believe he scored 66 goals in one season. A ridiculous uh, goal scorer at the OHL level. Hasn't been able to translate it to the NHL yet, but in a terrible situation with New York. I think in an organization like the Leafs, we saw it last year with someone like Galchenyuk, who had a very tough time since his rookie season in the NHL, was then able to kind of figure it out a little bit with the Leafs, put up a decent decent stat line. I see a very similar thing with Josh Hosang, and I'm absolutely ecstatic that the Leafs gave him that opportunity because I think if he's given an opportunity, you can see that untapped potential that he still has. Yeah, I think so. They're hoping that he's more of that late bloomer, I guess, too. Um, He's got some potential. He has really good potential. I don't know that much about him as a player, um, but I think he's got some upside. And like I said before, you can't have um, you can you can never have enough depth. And just to add him uh, with some scoring touch, a guy who can maybe play up and down the lineup too. maybe he fits into the top six some games as well if he cracks the lineup. Um, I want them to bring back Galchenyuk too, because I think that's just another great piece that you can have. Um, one, two, three of uh, Bunting, Hosang, and uh, and Galchenyuk. That that might have to that might have to be it. We'll see. We will see. Let's get into some notable former Leafs because Alex Galchenyuk has not been signed yet. But one left winger, former Leaf that has been signed. Actually, there's been a couple of them. But we will start with the big one that everybody's known for the past week. Zachary Heinemann, 5.5 mil per seven years with Edmonton. What we're going to do for this is we're not going to analyze every single signing. Yeah, yeah. One of some teams, specifically Edmonton, because woof. Uh, would you have given Zach Hyman this contract if you're the Toronto Maple Leafs? Not in a million years for me. Not not in a million years. That was way too much term. The most I would have been willing to give Zach Hyman was like four years, 4.5. Um, so much as I love Zach Hyman, he is very expendable. It's easy to find guys who are going to work hard in the NHL. It's not hard, um, especially with two great players like Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. He is a very expendable player. Um, and giving him a big contract would have been a mistake like what the Blackhawks did in 2016, giving players like Brian Bickle and Christopher Stieg big contracts who were depth guys who, yes, played a great role on the Blackhawks Cup winning team, but really weren't worth the 3.5 mil that they each got, I believe. Brian Bickle at least got 3.5 mil. Uh, was not worth that at the time. So I, I think the least avoided a catastrophic cat mistake here if they were to commit that much to Zach Hyman. As much as I love him, obviously uh, a fan favorite, I think they ultimately made the right decision moving on from them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If, if I'm the Leafs, you can't sign into that, that contract also because they can't afford it. They can afford it to do it anyways. Um, but I don't like, I don't like, I don't hate the contract for the Oilers in this case. I was expecting him to get even more money. I thought it was going to be over six at least. Um, but I think five and a half is still a little bit pricey, but it's not terrible. And I think Edmonton can make it work and they'll be looking back on it, it back on it and not having to like put Hyman on like an LTIR or trying to trade the contract or anything like that. Um, nothing bad is going to come out of it. I don't think um, playing him with McDavid is going to be huge. He's going to rack up a lot of points there. Um, so I think it's a positive that they got Hyman. He provides a lot. He can play power play penalty kill. We know him obviously very well. Um, sucks that he's gone. But uh, for that amount, I'm glad that the Leafs uh, moved on from him. Let's stick with Edmonton. I want to pull these contracts up because just I don't know what the hell they're thinking with these next two deals. But they got busy, and they decided to sign two-thirds of the Leafs' 2019 right-hand defensive, uh, right-hand defenseman, specifically Cody CC and Tyson Berry. Cody CC, I uh, have that written down. Three years, sorry, four years, 3.25 million. Yeah. Would you have given Cody CC 3.25 million over a three year deal in total? In no. total? No, no, I wouldn't have. That's Ken Holland hockey, though. 
Um, listen, like I moving on from Ethan Bear so you can sign Cody CC is just such an awful decision, and I can see maybe why they did it just because Ethan Bear having. They said it all day on the broadcast, but having Bouchard, Barry, and Bear, three offensive right shot defensemen, just doesn't really work with how they want to play. But Cody CC is god awful, and Ethan Bear yeah. is only twenty four, and he, I, I think they did a good job in getting someone like Warren Fogle back. I'm a big Warren Fogle fan, but um, to talk about the Cody CC contract, just absolutely horrid. Uh, the Tyson Barry one, I like. I think that's a solid deal. Um, he proved that what happened in Toronto was just a one off in a terrible situation. Uh, last year, we saw the real Tyson Berry, I think, in, in Edmonton playing very good hockey again, like he did in Colorado. And uh, I, I think that's a solid deal. But yeah, the, the Cody CC one is just absolutely absurd. Yeah. I, I like, so CC did play like very well in Pittsburgh last season. And I can see why teams were, were going to give him uh, a little bit of a, a promotion, I guess, or a bit of a, a raise. Um, but three point, whatever it was over $3 million for, for CC, who is terrible once he has the puck and terrible without the puck too. And in his defensive zone, he can't guard the forwards in front of the net and he can't move the puck up the ice and he can't shoot as well. So it's a terrible combination. So I don't see why Edmonton does it. I guess they just really were in desperate need of a right-handed defenseman as well, but I don't like it for them. I like the Barry signing. It's good that they they brought him back. Um, I'm sure Barry just wanted to stay there. He doesn't want to go um, to another another team because it did work out in Edmonton during that one year. And I guess he thinks that it can continue um, the success that he had there, playing with McDavid and Drysaddle as well. He was talking on Sportsnet. That was one of the biggest reasons why he wanted to stay. Uh, so I like it. Do I think he can keep up what he did last year? I don't know. He might. He might decline slightly, but uh, I think like he's he's not going to put up numbers that uh, that he did in Toronto again. I don't think that contract for Barry, by the way, is three years, four point five million per. I would not give him that if my life depended on it. That contract is terrible, and it's going to be terrible. And that entire right side sucks. Apart from I, Evan okay, Dwight. okay, I under like I can see why you're saying that. To play devil's advocate, he just led NHL defensemen in scoring last year, though. It's only three Tyson years. Barry, and it's only three years, and he's only 20, 30 now. He's so, 30, I, just 30. yeah, I don't think that is the worst contract given out today by any personally. Um, I think Tyson Berry, yes, you're going to get not great defensive capabilities out of him, but on a team like Edmonton, that guy quarterbacking your power play, pretty, pretty good. I, like, I, I, I think that's a good guy to have on your back end. Um, and I can understand after watching his season with the Leafs last year why a lot of people think Tyson Berry is bad. But I think what we saw last year was more indicative of the Tyson Berry that was what he was in Colorado. All right. Next player who's also given, in my opinion, an absolutely absurd contract, Frederick Anderson, signing a two-year $4.5 million per with the Carolina Hurricanes. What? I personally, I think that's a very good deal um, because Frederick Anderson has had good stats in the NHL in the regular season. There's no denying he, he had a bat. I mean, if we look at Frederick Anderson over, over the past, uh, anyone can chime in here. As I, I feel like, like, well, like two stats. seasons or something. Yeah, no, I, I honestly don't mind the deal either. Connor, like two years is pretty safe in the first place in terms of the term, but then he, he didn't get the raise. Cause I thought he was going to get a raise from, also, his, from his yeah. previous contract and to get like 500 K less, or was it 5.5 that he's making? He got like either a mil or five or 500 K less he's than he did. Five, uh, five mil. So he's five the, mil, yeah. to look at, okay. So let's look at his stats over the, uh, since he joined the lease. First season, nine eighteen, second season, nine seventeen, third season, nine Oh nine. And then obviously last year, a terrible, not a great season, but riddled with injury. I think, 4.5 for a guy who's consistently been a 915 save percentage goaltender in the NHL is a very, very solid deal. Um, it maybe looks worse based off what Grubauer got and how little money he got, but at the same time, Grubauer is fairly unproven. Whereas Frederick Anderson's been proven in the regular season, he has just struggled in the playoffs in the past. Yeah, I, I think it's a good deal for Carolina, but I can also see the hesitancy that that you may have. I, I still think that Frederick Anderson, when healthy, is a very good goaltender in this league and can be a starter. 
can look at the Allmark contract that Boston just signed with him. He's making five mil. I don't think Allmark is a better goalie than Frederick I, Anderson. I also think Frederick Anderson is never going to be the same because he's riddled with injuries. Yeah, that's it's, it's tough I to mean, see but that, I guess. You have yeah. to think that they would do their due diligence and if they really Well, I don't think the Carolina Hurricanes do their due diligence at this point, considering they were interested in Jake Mother Effing for Tannen and signed Tony D'Angelo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that that sure, but I'm saying from an injury perspective, you're not gonna sign a guy who you know is is really good. Like you, like no one would like the Kraken didn't take Carey Price because clearly there's more going on there with the injury. Like you're gonna do your due diligence on injuries. I agree. They didn't do their due diligence oh, on shoot. character check, but I, I think uh yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's a decent deal. I can see both sides of it though. I, I'm just here to to play to play the middle. Yeah, I was waiting for that. <laughs> Will Butcher and a fifth round pick to the Boston, not Boston, Buffalo Sabres for the greatest asset in hockey, future considerations. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. That's huh. a trade. Uh, is it? It's good to Buffalo. Well, <laughs> we'll get to why the New Jersey Devils made that trade in a little bit. Uh, let's stick with the former Leafs, notable former Leafs. Zach Bogosian, three years, 850K with Tampa. He didn't want to play for the Leafs because of COVID restrictions um, was ah. ultimately the sort of reason given. Uh, he hasn't really been able to see his family because they've been in the U.S. Uh, so that's why he left, I believe. Uh, I think he also had according to Dreger, maybe he had better offers from other teams and he chose to go back to Tampa, who he obviously won a cup with in the bubble. Um, so keeping that in mind, Aiden, because I know you wanted the Leafs to sign him. He probably wasn't coming back unless it was a massive overpay. Do you think Zach Bogosian made the right move, taking less money to go play for Tampa Bay? 10,000%. He's already made a lot of money in his career. He got that really famously bad contract with the Buffalo Sabres. Um, he, he doesn't care about money anymore. He wants to win and he's going back to the team that just won the last two years and he's going to play probably third pairing minutes on that team again. And yeah, I think it's a great signing for Tampa, a great signing for him. Uh, a, happy he gets to see his family again. Uh, he, it seemed like he had nothing but positive things to say about the Leafs. Um, in his press conference after leaving, which is good to see. And he seemed like a, like a great guy. Um, and the reputation that kind of preceded him because of his exit in Buffalo really wasn't the kind of guy that I really got the sense of from his time in Toronto. So seems like a good guy all around. So I'm happy to see that he's able to be happy and reconnected with his family. Yeah. Same here. Who wouldn't want to go to the back-to-back -back Stanley cup champions. And he has a chance to win three, three in a row with, uh, with Tampa then. So it's a great opportunity for him. Um, I'm happy for him. Um, three year deal as well. G gives him some uh, stability. Um, doesn't have to move his family, you know, year after year, taking one year contracts, he can kind of settle down and, and build something there in Tampa. And maybe he finishes his career there as well. After the three years, maybe he decides to, to hang it up, uh, after winning another cup or something. Um, it sucks. Cause like, that's the ideal player that you would want the Leafs to have on their back end. But uh, it's it's a steal for Tampa as well, like 800K. I, I wasn't expecting him to get that that low, but he must love it there. It's a great place to play. Taxes are good, so he's 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 loving life in the, in uh, in Tampa, and he's also very familiar with it. Obviously, with playing playing there in the bubble, uh, he's gonna play probably the David Savard role as well. There, just replacing him on the bottom pair, right-handed guy. It'll be good. All right. We will stick with former Leafs defenseman Luke Shen. And the reason I bring him up is he was a potential depth option for the Leafs as well. Uh, but he signed with Vancouver two years, 850,000 bucks. Would you have signed this deal? Uh, yeah, I think he's a solid depth piece. He's won a cup the last two seasons and he's analytically actually been pretty solid with Tampa. So I think it's a solid deal for Vancouver, a team that had the worst defense in the NHL last year. 
I don't know. I don't really have that much to say. I because Luke Shen's been kind of like that healthy scratch um, this past season, especially. I don't know how much hockey he has left in him, but just a guy who brings more experience to Vancouver, who's trying to accomplish the same thing that Tampa has. So he definitely adds something, and the contract is basically nothing. It's like eight hundred fifty k. It's not much. And speaking of Vancouver, they signed Nick Patin, two year deal yeah. or two way deal, eight hundred or seven hundred fifty thousand bucks. I love the move. The guy's from BC. I think he'll get a better opportunity than he will with the Leafs. Uh, just good for him. I think it's yeah. really the bottom of this contract. There's not really much analysis that should go into it, no. <laughs> except for the fact that the Vancouver Canucks continue to sign and bring in Toronto Maple Leafs. My love, the love of my life when it comes to hockey goalies, James Reimer to San Jose, two years, 2.25 per. Do you like the contract? What do you think he's going to look like in a tandem with Aiden Hill in San Jose? Uh, yeah, I think it's a solid move for him at this point in his career. Go back to where it all started in San Jose. And yeah, I think, um, Aiden Hill, you can't fully rely on to be your clear cut starter yet. Um, I think by the end of the season, he may be getting majority of the starts, but I think Reimer's a good guy to transition into, uh, into net with him. And yeah, I think it's a very good move for Reimer. Good move for the Sharks. Yeah, I could even see a possibility where like one of them gets moved at the deadline for a team that needs a backup goalie because San Jose is not going to be competing in that Pacific division, I don't think. Um, so maybe one of them will get traded. What they do you need guys the say? signings like they think they're going to be. So yeah, exactly. But but I mean, we all know like uh, James Reimer, James Reimer, Aiden Hill tandem shouldn't really be making you the playoffs. I don't no. think. No, 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 for sure. It's a good contract, though. I, I thought Reimer was going to get more as well. I thought he was going to get similar to like what Bernier got, like three and a half. Um, and honestly, if uh, if he didn't sign with San Jose, maybe Colorado was going to look at it and maybe overpay for, for James Reimer. Speaking of Bernier, he signed a two-year 4.125 per with New Jersey. Now their tandem will be Bernier and uh, I'm blanking on it. Blackwood. Blackwood, yeah. Uh, what do you think about this Bernier contract? Because I think that's a pretty big overpay. Uh, I, yeah, you know what you're... Here's the thing. You know what you're getting out of Jonathan Bernier. He's a very consistent NHL goalie. He's been consistent last six seasons, really. Five seasons. Um, so, yeah, it might be a bit of an overpay, but to pair him with someone like Mackenzie Blackwood, who is a younger, not as experienced NHL goalie, who has shown that he can play really well, but some nights he's also not playing very well at all. Um, so I think it's a very good depth option. It looks like the Devils have made some pretty savvy moves today. So, uh, yeah, I like what they've done. Yeah, I um, I think it is a bit pricey as well, um, but they have the cap space to make it work. And I think you need a, a veteran guy to kind of show Blackwood the way. And I don't know if Bernie is the best veteran guy to be doing that, but he's going to – um, give you a lot more starts in the net, just more st stability. They can um, finally have like a, I won't say Bernier is like a starter, but like a one B guy in your net just to get you a lot of starts. So Blackwood doesn't have to be starting as much anymore. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a good signing, I guess, but, um, and, and how long is the term? Like three years, two years, three, two years. I think it's, it's pretty good then. Cause that contract won't bite you. I think that will be one of the best goal-keeping tandems in the NHL next season. Wow. That'll just be increased with their signings and stuff they've done today. Um, final notable leaf that hasn't... The number hasn't come out, but there's a little bit of information on it. Nick Felino is reportedly signing with the Boston Bruins for two years with an AAV in the high threes. Hmm. Good, bad, ugly. Would you have signed that contract? I would. Uh, I don't think the Nick Felino that the, you saw in the Leafs last year is the Nick Felino that you're going to get. He was clearly playing through injury. Um, analytically, a very, very good defensive forward. And I think a guy that fits into Boston very well. People were quick to say this Taylor Hall move. What the hell are you doing? This guy's not playing well this year. It's clear that. Going to a good team can make people play a lot better, and especially if they're healthy. And I think Nick Felino is going to flourish at a place like Buffalo, play, pardon me, Boston, playing uh, 
probably second or third line uh, minutes. And I think I think he's going to do well there. Uh, I think he makes Boston a much stronger team along with the Linus Allmark signing that they've also made today. Yeah, they made some good signings. Like They also got Eric Halla and Thomas Noshek. I think their depth is really good on, on forward now. So, I mean, they're going to be tough to beat in the Atlantic. And probably, we might have to face them. If we, if we make the playoffs next year, then we might have to face them in the first round again. Yeah, we will uh, make the playoffs next year. No, none of that attitude. I yeah, I'm not gonna say that. Uh, not yet. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know. I feel like that is. I like I like Nick Foligno. That's what I'll say. I don't know about the contract. I don't know if that's gonna work out. It might be a bit high, but I really like Nick Foligno. He's a captain. He's gonna come into the room and he's gonna act like the captain, and he's gonna lead by example on the ice as well. He's gonna be physical. Uh, he can score as well. Um, he's not just a um, a gritty guy that can penalty kill. He can put the puck in the net. He adds a lot of experience. I think that Bruin team is looking like a real Stanley Cup contender now with, with Foligno. All right. And that wraps up our notable Leafs. For the other signings that we're going to do, I am simply want good, yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be, yeah. <laughs> okay, good, good bad, bad or, bad. Yeah, got it. All right. Yeah. We will start with Alexander Wenberg, three years, 4.5 per with Seattle. Good, bad, or ugly? In between bad and ugly. Yeah, same. David Savard, four years, 3.5 per in Montreal. Good. I'll go bad on that one. All right. First disagreement. Cedric Paquette, one year, 950K with Montreal. Very good. good. Yeah, very good. good. Good because they get a Quebec-based player, I think. <laughs> Alex Golgoski, one year, five million in Minnesota. Actually, good. not not as bad as you think. Very, very good underlying numbers. So I'm gonna go with good. I, I know it sounds year. stunning, but and it's only one year. But Golgoski, sorry to interject too much, but Golgoski's underlying defensive numbers are very, very good, and he goes to a team that already has pretty good defensive. Uh, players so have sheltered minutes i like it i say good i think it's he's a good player i think you probably could have gotten him a lot cheaper though that's fair another very weird one Braden holtby dallas one year two mil keep in mind dallas now have ben bishop jake ottinger holtby and anton hudobin yeah mm -hmm. trade incoming Maybe two. I agree uh, with good, just based off the contract. I think it's a good bet contract. Yeah, very good. I'll say very good. I'll say bad because he's not a good goalie. I think I already know what your answers to this one will be, and if it isn't, I might have to kick you off this podcast. But Tucker Pullman, four years, <laughs> 2.5 million bucks per. As ugly as can be, like bought, arguably worst contract of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll say it could be worse, but it's it's bad. Yeah. I don't know how much worse it could be because Vancouver continued their trend of signing terrible contracts with the next one and Travis Hamanick, two years, three million per. Not ugly, but bad. Yeah, that one's pretty bad too. I I, th I think it's like Pullman level, honestly. I don't like Hamanick as a player. All right, this is going to be an interesting one. Blake Coleman, six years, four point nine million per with Calgary. Good. This one's this one's tough. I'm going to say bad. I think it's an overpay. I think he is a second line forward that should be making four mil max. I don't know about four point nine. I will enter this first time I'll interject. I will say I think it's a meh contract because I think the dollar's okay, but I don't like the term. That's especially right. style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another weird one, although we could fully see this coming considering who this person is. Ryan Sutter, four years, 3.5 per with Dallas. Suter. Suter. Uh, can I just like, be like perfectly in the middle? Like I'm indifferent, not good or bad. We'll add a meh. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm mad. I'm mad. 
<laughs> I'm going to be saying meh a lot then. Um, I'll say I'll say it's bad. I'll say bad. Mikhail Granlund, four years, five million per with Nashville. Good. I think it's good. I'm going to say think. bad again. I'm going to say bad. I don't know where Nashville's trying to go here. Are they trying to win or are they trying to rebuild? I I don't think Granlund's worth five mil. Dougie Hamilton, New Jersey, seven years, Nine million per best contract of the day. In my opinion, the best defenseman in the NHL right now. Uh, yeah, you could argue. So I think, and, and sorry, I know I'm going off, but based off what Seth Jones got, who horrid season last year, <laughs> like God awful season last year. This and Dougie Hamilton up until his leg break had an, a terrific season. Uh, yes, very, very, very good signing. Yep, I agree. Very good. Philip Grubauer, six years, 5.9 per with Seattle. That's going to be, before you talk, a hell of a goalie tandem with Vanasek, Drieger, and Holt, uh, Grubauer. And Joey Decor, too. <laughs> I gotta go, I'm actually going to go bad on this one. Hmm. I know that might be stunning, but I just, I'm not sold on Grubauer yet fully, and that's a long term commitment. But. Seattle has, I like it. It's a ballsy move. You should be doing it. I think it could end up being really good, but it could also end up being really bad. So they yeah. have security with Dreger, and it sounds like Vanacek is probably on his way out now with this signing, but they do have security with Dreger as a backup. So it's actually probably more math than bad, but yeah, that's what I would say. I'll go good. I think it's a pretty good deal. I, I don't know how, how um, Colorado let him go, though. All right. Jake McCabe, four years, four mil with Chicago. Obviously, four mil per. Uh, if you get the Jake McCabe from last year, greatest deal of all time, uh, arguably because he was unbelievable last year in like 15 games. But I'm going to just say meh because you don't know what Jake McCabe you're going to get. Yeah, I agree with that. I'll go meh as well. Philip Deneau, six years, 5.5 per with LA. Bad. Good. Good. He is a very, very good NHL player. Defensive I, NHL player. <laughs> I, I think I, people are stunned by the money, but you need to have good defensive NHL players now uh, on offense. And I think you got to pay for them. And I think it, it their center depth with Kopitar and then Byfield and him, it's just going to be so much fun to watch. I think the Kings could be a sneaky playoff team because that Western division is just our what's what is it pacific, pacific division is just horrid so kings could be a sneaky uh sneaky playoff team i think wow it's gonna be very interesting, interesting to see what they do with their prospects including gabe velarde uh and uh smith and everybody they have uh because they have way too many centers but Jaden schwartz five years 5.5 per with seattle meh a lot of term but he's a very good defensive forward yeah, I'll go Meh as well. I think he's he's been dealing with some injuries throughout his career too. Like, is he really going to be healthy? And and yeah, the term is is a lot too. Um, the dollar value is, is about right, but the term is a bit much. Eric Halla, two years, I believe 2.4 per with Boston. Good. I like Eric Halla. It's a good deal. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. I was expecting a bit less, but it's good. Alex Edler, one year, 3.5 per with LA. Good. He had a bad year last year, but the Canucks were just awful. Alex Edler, in my opinion, is still a very solid NHL defenseman, and that's very good monetary value for a solid NHL defenseman. When you look at Cody Cece getting like pretty much the same amount over four more years or three more years, I think that's a good one-year gamble on, on Alex Edler. Yep, I agree. Nick Benino, two years, 2.05 per with San Jose. Very good. Yeah, very good, very good. Mike Hoffman, expected to sign with the Habs, three years, 4.5 per. Uh, I'm going to go meh. I think that's how I started the show. I was very in the middle, and I'm going to stay there. Still not sure what to think of it. I think it's a good contract, and it's going to work out well for them. All right. Linus Allmark, Buffalo, uh, to Boston, I put the wrong team in, four years, Five mil per. 
I think good. He had incredible stats with a terrible Buffalo team last year. He had a winning record with the Buffalo Sabres as a goalie last year. That is hard to do. Uh, so I think it good. I think he's a very good goalie, just been in a terrible situation his whole career. Yeah, it's hard to disagree with that. I, I think it's going to work out well. I think it it is slightly a little bit much because, I, like I said, I, I thought some other goalies were going to get paid more than him. But I think it's going to be a very good deal, and he's probably going to have like the best season of his career as well. All right, Pius Pius Sutter, two years, three point two five per with Detroit. Very good. Uh, came over last year from I believe the Swiss League and was absolutely incredible for Chicago with bottom six minutes. And I think Detroit is a great place for him to grow. So very good contract. Yeah, I wasn't expecting him to get paid that much, but he did have a good year on Chicago. I think he had a couple of hat tricks too um, mm-hmm. throughout the year. So yeah, it's going to be good. He's a young player. He's going to fit in well with that young core, and uh, they can afford to pay him three mil because they got a ton of cap space. So it works out well. It's a good contract. I'm adding one more at the end because I find this an odd contract. Ryan gets laugh. One year, four point five million. Uh, pretty bad, I think. But he's staying in Anaheim, so I I can't knock it really keeping a legend around like that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's it's meh. And it's, it's one year. He's been there his whole career. Like massive pay cut. Yeah, I, I think it's a good. I, I think it's meh. It's meh. All right, and I believe they just made it official too. <laughs> so. Nice. Extension will do the same thing. I'll include Seth Jones, just cuts. Braden Point, eight years, nine point five per with Tampa. In- incredible. I it's it's he's making less than Marner, and I'm so upset. But yeah, yeah. incredible signing. Who are you upset at? Dubis or Marner? <laughs> uh Paul Marner. Probably. Paul Marner. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, it's a great signing. Braden Point, one of the best players in the world. Nine point five. That's great. All right, final one. Just I feel like I have to include him because, God, this contract. Seth Jones, eight years, nine point five per. One of the worst contracts I've seen in the last couple of years. He finished third percentile in WAR last year for all defensemen, which is just horrid. Um, yeah, just awful. I think it's awful right now, but it could definitely turn around. He could. Yeah. He it, There was a point in his career where he was a very, very good NHL defenseman, but his last two seasons have not been right. the case. But I agree. He could turn it around, but a lot of money to gamble on a guy turning it around. That's, definitely. that's for sure. Yeah. I, I feel like if he was a left-handed defenseman, it would have been like 7 mil, 7.5. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially, potentially. And I guess he gets to play with his brother now, too. So that's yeah. Let's talk some basketball because I think we have to. At the point of this podcast going up, this will probably have already happened. Um, being the draft, I'm not sure when you're uploading this. Eight. I'll try and get it up. Pro- yeah, I can pro- try and get it up for tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Well, if it is up before the draft, I want to get your thoughts quickly. <laughs> Even though Nigel, yeah. you're a Sixers fan, mm-hmm. what do you think the Raptors do with the fourth overall pick tomorrow? Because that seems to be, apart from our next topic, the biggest discussion in the NBA surrounding the draft right now. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Uh, this Raptors team is obviously a pretty good team who just had a really crappy year last year. But that being said, I think. So based off that logic, a lot of people would say, oh, why don't you trade that? Because the, the fourth overall pick is worth a lot of value, especially, in my opinion, a fairly deep, deep draft such as this. Um, but I would keep it, uh, and I would draft Kaminga, Jonathan Kaminga, the French small forward. I think he is being vastly underrated. I think he has the highest ceiling out of anyone in this draft. Uh, and in my opinion, I I... Listen, I would take him first overall. I know Cade Cunningham is the consensus number one pick, <laughs> but I think Jonathan Kaminga, I've done a lot of watching of his games in Europe. He is an incredible talent and his G League uh, elite stats. Maybe weren't the best last year, but keep in mind, it's an 18-year-old playing against grown men. Um, I like it a lot. 
I like him a lot. And I think, you know, it's the perfect Raptors pick because they like to pick guys like, look, Pascal Siakam off the board, huge upside works out, right? He He's someone like that. Like if he has so much untapped potential, he has the body t- for the NBA, the incredible ability. He just needs to put it all together. And I think the Raptors are a team where he can really help harness this and, you know, realize this potential. Uh, and I, I would not think any, like, I think, Masai is going to make a swing because he always does. So I think that's who the Raps are going to pick up for. Personally. Wow. That left me. I think, I think, I think I got to clip that and put it on Instagram. <laughs> yes. Please uh, do. It's a pretty big one. Immediately after the Raptors pick either Scotty Barnes or, um, or if you're right. Yeah. I, I don't love Scotty Barnes, but I think he is, a, he also could be a very good player. I'm just not sold on him as much. As I think with fourth overall, you're in an awkward spot because it's like top three, you're expecting to have a great player right away. But with the fourth overall pick, you can kind of switch. That's when you can start taking a couple more swings on guys. And I think you shoot for the moon. I mean, European players have proven the last three seasons have been European MVP winners in the NBA. So I think it's kind of been um, the changing of the guard, so to speak, that like the European game is getting a lot more respect. And I think uh, someone like Kaminga is a great great guy to jump on wow so would you trade back then or would you take him at four uh it depends like i've seen mock drafts that have had coming going two or three and then i've seen some that have had him going nine like i believe the last one from the athletic had him going five um so it's or six so it's really reading the room like i obviously they would have more intel on what other teams are thinking about him if you think you can get him at four or you think if you can trade back and get him, go ahead. But if he's still on the board at four, um, I, I would not be shocked to see the Raptors call him, call his name tomorrow night. Wow. Aiden, do you have any thoughts? I do not have any thoughts. I, I'm not the biggest basketball fan, so I'm not sure what they could do at the draft. Um, but I, th- I think they should, I think they should take the pick. I, I don't think they should trade it away. I think, if I'm uh, if I'm looking in from the outside at the Raptors um, and the the poor season that they had last year, I think it it might be best to kind of take even a further step back and maybe maybe not go for a full on rebuild, but to just do a, more of a retool, take the next two years off, develop guys, draft well, and then load up uh, in a couple of years and make another run. So they need another like young star on their team. I don't see that them trading that pick away. Mm-hmm. Breaking trade. Daniel Vladder, goalie for Boston Bruins, sent to the Calgary Flames for a third round pick. Right. Very nice. I think I picked that guy up in fantasy for like a game. Dan <laughs> Vladder. Yeah. So I think he'll probably be the backup in Calgary. Uh I think behind Markstrom. Because they have nobody else. <laughs> yeah, they have no one else. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna Brent, I'm gonna add this just because I think this is interesting. Mm-hmm. And I didn't put it in the notes. What do you think happens to Pascal Siakam? Because he's been very talked about in trade rumors recently. Yeah. Um, it's hard because he's obviously on quite a bit of salary. So it's going to be interesting to see if a team is willing to take. I think Pascal Siakam is a hell of a player who just had a really tough season last year. But I also think Pascal Siakam cannot be a number one guy in an offense. I think he's a great complementary piece. I don't think he can be your guy proven with Kawhi. He was a great complimentary piece to Kawhi. Um, but last year when they said, here's the ball, can you get us a bucket? He kind of struggled a bit more. And that's why a lot of his percentages went down and his efficiency went down. But I think if the Raptors are able to kind of get another, someone who, someone else who can be a guy or if they draft well and whoever they draft and turns into a star first year, um, I think Pascal Siakam's game will vastly improve again. I wouldn't trade him because I think he's a very good player. Um, who just had a tough season. I think all of the Raptors had a tough season, obviously terrible circumstances um, having to be in Florida the whole season. So I, I would, I would stick around on Pascal Siakam, but I could also see why they'd want to trade him to kind of retool and rebuild the whole organization. Aiden. I don't know. I don't know if I thought so pa- Pascal Siakam, he's a great player. Um, I would, I would hang on to him for the time being, I think, and just see how he does the next couple of years. Um, Cause I think he can be like the Kyle Lowry, you know, 
if he if he plays like he did two years ago and not how he did last year, I think mm-hmm. he can be um, like the next face of the franchise and then will help the young guys transition into the next phase of Raptors success. Um, I think he's a great guy to to be that face of the franchise and he's had a he has a phenomenal story. I don't think the Raptors want to lose like a good person like that. Um, and I, I think I think he he should stay around for at least a few more years. Um, I think it, it will be determined on money though too like, and and his playing style. like if he has a big year, like are they really gonna want to overpay for for Pascal? I'm not sure. Well, he has three years left on his contract, I think, or four years. Is it four um, years now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it was a five years. So they won't side. have to worry about that then, I guess. But no. I think yeah. if you can get seven, you can get Wiggins, you can get Wiseman, and maybe even 14. I think you would I do that. Out. Oh, yeah. I agree. So really we'll see what. That. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, you keep four. You keep so four. Oh. This oh, is and, just, and then you just trade Siakam you, for the seventh. Yeah, and I you get see. 14th and a young player like uh, James Wiseman, who I think is going to be a hell of a player, tough first season as well. I, I agree. that is If that is the deal on the table, that is a very good one. It okay. was rumored earlier in the offseason that the Warriors are looking to package Wiggins, or not Wiggins, Wiseman, number seven, number 14. Wiggins would be salary filler. Uh, that was rumored early in the offseason. They're looking to make a deal for that, and I think... Siaka makes a lot of sense for them in mm-hmm. that for sure. Caliber, and it makes a lot of sense for the Raptors too. But we will see what happens tomorrow because that is ultimately when this decision will be made. But we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about your team who's trying to rob the Toronto Raptors yeah. with one of the worst trade offers I think I've ever seen in the history of sports. I, I listen, I don't actually, uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to play defend the Sixers here. <laughs> I think this is Daryl Morey being Daryl Morey. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen the rumor, it was Ben Simmons for Fred Van Vliet, OG Ananobi, Kyle Lowry, and the fir- fourth what? overall. What? <laughs> what? Well, to be fair, it's, it's the it's the contract rights to Kyle Lowry, so it's not actually. But it's a yeah, sign. no, I know. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, even I, without Lowry, that's a pretty massive trade. Yeah, and I don't think there's any chance in hell the Sixers would get anything remotely close to that to Ben Simmons when his value is at an all-time low. Um, who I'd be content getting from the Raptors. I think if if they are to make a trade with the Raptors, I think Fred Van Fleet needs to be in it um, f- for for me to be content. And I I don't know if the Sixers or part of me if the Raptors will be willing to part with someone like Fred Van Fleet, but. The Sixers can't trade Siakam for Simmons because you end up in the same hole of a guy who's not really that confident when he has the ball in his hands. And although maybe as a complimentary piece to Embiid, he works, but I, I don't see that really working. They tried that with Al Horford and it was a massive failure. So I don't know where Ben Simmons is going to end up. I think the most logical destination is either Portland or Washington, Bradley Beal or Damian Lillard. Those are two names who've been rumored um, the Sixers are interested in. I would love Bradley Beal on the Sixers. He is one of the most underrated players in the NBA, just a pure scorer. Given the ball, he can score at any point. And I think Ben Simmons makes sense for a rebuilding organization in Washington. Um, someone to take a chance on who obviously is way better than what he showed last year in the playoffs, but is low on confidence right now. So ultimately, I have no idea what's going to happen. I think it's time for Ben Simmons to move on from the Sixers, though. There's no denying that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see where he ends up. I think you'd be lucky to get Kyle Lowry and Chris Boucher for Ben Simmons from the Raptors, to be honest. Um, but again, apparently they're very interested, and so are the Miami Heat and uh, one other team who I can't remember off the top of my head. But we will see what happens with Ben Simmons. I quickly want a prediction before we do our hot takes and get out of here because we've been going for almost two hours at this point. Does Ben Simmons get moved this offseason, or is he a Philadelphia 76er come game one? He is moved this offseason. I Dar- if Daryl Morey wasn't the president, I would say who knows. Uh, but he, he he is quick to pull the trigger on a deal. He does not mess around and he knows what is good for this team and he's act aggressively and actively shopping them. So I imagine he will be gone by I'd say a month from now. He is not on the Philadelphia 76ers. Aiden, prediction? 
I think he's gone too. From what I've been hearing from 76ers fans, they just don't like Ben Simmons at all, and they want him out of town. So they'll well, be very unhappy. You'll be very unhappy if he's back. To def- he is my favorite player in the NBA. He he is partially like I okay. I've been following him since he was 16. So I I do have uh, an affinity to Ben Simmons. I do love him, but and I don't want him gone because it's sad. But to better the team, he does need to move on. I think it's better right. for both parties. For sure. Is Kyle Lowry a Philadelphia 76er? And can I have Matisse Thybul in the sign and trade, please? Uh, I'd love Kyle Lowry to be a 76er. Uh, no, because Matisse Thybul is such an important part of the Sixers. Uh, all NBA defender, second team, absolutely. For a guy who only plays 20 minutes a night, is absolutely ridiculous. One of the best defenders I've ever watched in the NBA. Uh, yeah, so much fun. Love his YouTube channel, too, with the vlogs. Just all around just just a great NBA player. Uh, I love Matisse Thibel. I want him so badly. I want him so <laughs> I want him so badly. Uh, but I doubt we'll get him. We need to wrap up, though, because we got to do hot takes. And we've been going for two almost two hours. We started, I think, 5 or 4.05. And okay. it's currently still one. Um, hot takes. If you're not familiar with this segment, we end the show with it every episode where we give a hot take on anything and everything in the world of sports. I said in the past, Gabe Velarde will be the re- main return in a Morgan Riley trade. I also said that the NH- or NMLB would be the first le- league back at the beginning of the pandemic. Some of us aren't as bad at, at that, specifically Aiden, who guessed correctly that Mike Babcock would be fired within two weeks. Do nice. either of you have a hot take prepared? Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll do one. Go ahead. It's your show. No, you go. No, you go. You're oh. the guest. guest uh, okay. Uh, I'll keep it quick. It's it's a soccer or a football one, but I got to go with this is a bold one. I'm an Arsenal fan. Arsenal finish in the top four next season. I think not playing European football, uh, having to have those midweek games. They've made some great signings already. I really like the, the way this squad is moving. Um, I think, yeah, just the sheer less volume of games you're going to have not playing in Europe will really help them focus on the league league part of me and i think league results will follow from that i think arsenal can finish in the top four next season a very hot take i know but yeah that is a pretty hot take we'll see how much of an impact ben white can have uh up top for arsenal along with obamiang and i think lacazette might be getting sold to atletico madrid potentially i thought i saw yeah. him on that like, yeah um so who knows we get a soccer hot take from somebody <laughs> that isn't me for the first time yeah Aiden, are you going to follow the trend? Soccer hot takes. Uh, England wins the uh, the Olympic gold medal. How about that? <laughs> no, uh, um, that can be one of them. But no, my hot take is uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs are sellers at next year's trade deadline. Wow. Yeah, and uh, that probably will also mean that they don't make the playoffs. Wow. Right. Yep. My hot take, by the time we record our next episode, Alex Kerfoot is no longer a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. I like it. I like that too. Yeah. If we could push this recording back until he gets traded or is he your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, thank you so much for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. This has been a ton of fun as we've had trades and signings break mid-episode. Um, check out everything. Nigel does in the description of the YouTube video. Follow all of these fine fellows on Twitter, even though Aiden doesn't use on it. Twitter, or- Instagram, YouTube. Give us your ats for both of them. Uh, Nigel, where can people find you at? Uh, I'm at Nigel underscore Gebection on Insta and then just at Nigel Gebection on Twitter. Hard to spell, but if you look up Nigel, I'm sure I'll pop up. It's going to be in the description <laughs> as well. Uh, Connor and I's socials are also in the description, so check us out there. And yeah. You're not Cheers, guys. That was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's a blast having you on. Yeah, uh, it was a ton of fun. Check out the MLS Multiplex podcast and all my written stuff there, even though I do an article a month at this point. Uh, check out Aiden's Unlimited podcast, turning out tons of stuff and tons of spoilers for Marvel stuff. Uh, so right. if, you don't, if you haven't seen the Loki series, don't go and look at his Instagram. Uh, <laughs> but I, I got spoiler listening. warning, so yeah, you're good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Thank you for listening. We will see you with our next episode whenever that next episode is.
hopefully Kerfoot, hopefully that hot take comes true, but hopefully. <laughs> Have a good week, and we'll see you next time. Peace.